Welcome to part two of A Flood of Memories, my presentation on the flood of 55. While I shared a variety of stories in the first part of my presentation, here I'll be sharing detailed interviews of Sharon Nystrom Watson and Mary Pizzoni. Sharon was at a high school party on Laurel Street when flood waters entered the home. Mary was at her childhood home on San Lorenzo Boulevard. While I shared part of Mary's story in the first part of my presentation, I haven't yet shared with you what happened to her family after the flood waters receded. That was when the real problem started, but you'll have to listen to her interview to hear more. I should mention these are only audio interviews. I apologize for this. To add to the experience, I'll be showing a variety of photos of the flood and its aftermath. I'm sure you will enjoy them. I should also explain, as I did in the first part of my presentation, I'm creating an archive of information on the flood to be stored at Santa Cruz's Museum of Art and History. If anyone would like to share their experiences of the flood, or if you have any questions or comments about my project, please contact me at eastsidehistory at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. With that, on with the interviews. Well, that day, I know it had rained for, I think it was a week, a whole week. Um, and it was 18 inches or above, something like that. And of course, in the valley, that translates to a little bit more in the San Lorenzo Valley always. And I was working downtown for two different people, the insurance company right around the corner of Laurel and Pacific. And I got my, my first job, which was my dream job at Woolworth. And I went to work that evening, December 22nd, that evening, and I was going to work through the holidays. Of course, that job lasted the five hours I put in on that night. And then I went to a, a friend's house for a, a kind of a little senior party on the 22nd, probably, I would say, 8 o'clock, 7, 8 o'clock in the evening. And we knew that the the river was, was pretty swollen and Always, every year, it went over at Ocean and Barson and around that area. So when they said it was going to flood, we didn't think too much of it. You know, okay, all the low-lying areas are going to flood. That's pretty common. And then much later, I think it was after 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, we um, were at the party and up on Laurel Street just two houses up from Foster Freeze. And all of a sudden the wires started coming up Laurel Street. Yow, this is a flood. And we were at a, in a two-story house. And then when the water, there was probably 10 steps up the porch. And we figured, well, it'll come up the steps. Little did we know that little by little, it started invading the house and coming up the first story, you know, and I think, I can't remember, but it was either five or six feet inside the house, even after coming up the steps, which were, you know, higher, that made the house higher. And we kept going up the stairs and up the stairs, and finally we were sitting most of the night on the second story landing watching the water, couldn't believe it. The refrigerator was almost covered with water, and never did I think to ask afterwards. I'm sure they had to replace everything in the house, and the downstairs <coughs> part, excuse me. And um, then the next day, after we, we kept watching, and I know the young guys that were there, they got a hold, somehow they got a hold of a, rowboat was right around the area and there were several several elder people living in those little houses on Laurel Street in the second block and they went around and t 
took him out and took him up Laurel Street to the higher ground. And the next day, then, the water did recede some slowly, but around noon or two o'clock in the afternoon, we could walk out to Laurel School, to the outer edge of Laurel School, and it was probably, I'd say, waist high. We were carrying our stuff above our head to get there, and my parents came and picked us up. And I didn't know too much about what was going on on Pacific Avenue till later. I didn't witness anything going on on Pacific Avenue. But I went down to the real estate office that I was working at through the school program and helped a little bit clean up. And the silt was just unimaginable on the paperwork. But we saved a lot of the paperwork by gently pulling all of the papers away. Of course, now everything would be on a flash drive and you'd grab the flash drive. But then every paper counted. And uh, then, of course, I heard later. And I had put away, a uh, lay away my mother's Christmas gift. They let the students do that at the time. At least in least lay away, a department was in the basement. So needless to say, I did not get that. And uh, I thought many years later when I was relating the story, I don't think Lisa ever gave me my money back, <laughs> which was a very small amount. But um, I know that they were driving the cars. All the car dealers were on Front Street at the time. And they were driving the cars up to King Street and up around Mission Street to get them out of the um, floodwaters. But um, we were told that there were tunnels under Pacific Avenue. And apparently all the tunnels got full, too, from, I don't know, maybe that's what ruined... I know they had to dig up some of the streets. and mm -hmm. Or I don't know if that time, that might have been later in the 89 flood that they actually yeah, did. Earthquake. I mean, earthquake, yeah. But they did have to do a lot of repair work for 55, too. And in my opinion, it, it really changed the face of downtown. So many businesses went out. Like we used to go to the Garibaldi Hotel, which when I was a child I thought was out in the river. But it was on the river's edge, and it was just destroyed. And so many businesses just didn't come back after the after the flood. And the ones that did it, of course, it took them time because the silt was just, it's like a fine sand. And it there's probably marks around town that show how high the flood was. And that's, that's kind of my recollection. And then, of course, most of the other... Things I found out about the flood was hearsay or stories or through the Sentinel and such, you know. I didn't witness Pacific Avenue except the aftermath of it. But that was uh, really something to see our downtown <laughs> right there on Laurel Street underwater. And I don't know how they ever cleaned up after all that. Every, you know, thing cleaned up after all that. I'm sure the power was out, and I know the phones were out because we couldn't call. And so um, that's, that's what I remember. And my husband, now, we were going to, just starting to go out in high school, and he came by earlier in the evening and wanted me to, to give me a ride home. And I said, no, I'll stay for a while. And he had had a tooth pulled that day, so he couldn't stay. But he worked at Modern Bakery, which was just real, now Kumba Jazz Center, right. which was real close to the house. And he had to go in and really clean up the next day, a couple of days too. But he was at Modern, he wasn't, he had gotten off work at Modern Bakery. Or, now I think he just came from the dentist at that time, but th that had had a dentist. Appointment. He wasn't feeling too good. But I declined the ride home at that time. Of course. <laughs> How was Santa Cruz different before the flood? Oh, it was just very quiet in the winter time. It was really a summer tourist town. Summer was just the the population just expanded tremendously, of course, and um, 
it was everything closed down. You could go down on a Sunday evening on Pacific Avenue after five o'clock. Nothing was open. Maybe a restaurant, maybe the movies, but there weren't people walking around. It was just a quiet tourist town. And in the winter, some businesses even closed, you know, if they were catering to the summer tourists. So I think in that way, um, I don't know whether that really changed it. I don't think it destroyed as many buildings as like later, but it it changed businesses, some like a, say the ones that had to go out. And the car dealers, that's what was different. They all moved out from Front Street. They were down in the wa where the water was. Where did you know? they go? Uh, a lot of them to the east side. Um, you know, I can't remember where a lot of... I know Ford moved to the east side. And I think Chevrolet stayed downtown. We only had... There weren't imported cars then. Right. Yeah, we only had the American car dealerships. And I know that uh, Chrysler Plymouth was right by the broad, what is now the Broadway Bridge, which wasn't there. It was in that little, well, it's kind of a triangular, mm -hmm. well, near the, near the arena, right. where the arena is. Well, my first recollection is once I realized that a flood might happen, there was water coming down the street, but not much, I took all the Christmas presents upstairs to the second level. I wanted to save those. <laughs> you know, five-year-old, right? Um, then... That's when my father realized that it was getting serious and he and my brother went down to try to retrieve some of the boats from his boat business that were tied up that they later let people use to try to rescue some of the elderly people in the area. Because there was, there was no help. I mean, it was just everybody was looking out for each other. Um, so... That's when we went down in the truck and my thumb got smashed in the truck door by my, let's see, he would have been 23 year old brother. About what time was that? Dusk. Okay. So it had been raining really hard steadily for two weeks and I don't think anyone realized how severe it, the water rose really quickly. like maybe in a matter of 12 hours to flood stage. Um, it was, it came down the street, it came over down the street, kind of where the new bridge is. So if you're, the, the Laurel Street Bridge, mm -hmm. there was no bridge there. So it went through an orchard and then started filling out that way. I'm not sure which side it went on in Santa Cruz on the other side. But, you know, it was just, it was lovely eucalyptus-lined river. There was, there was not much room for it to, you know, get higher before it went over. Right. I would say, I'm looking at, thinking about the levee now, at least half lower than, so the, the banks of the river was at least half again as low. Understood. Um, so, what's the next thing I remember? Um, well, after my thumb, then I think my mom gave me some aspirin and I think I went to bed. So, in the meantime, I was, I was too young to be afraid, but I remember hearing big logs coming down you know, from the mountains mm. and hitting the house all night. So that was a little fearful. I mean, it could have knocked it off this, you could have knocked it off the foundation. Mm -hmm. Could have. Um, and I'm sure my parents were up all night, obviously. Um, 
the water came into our house on the bottom level up to five feet. Wow. So we were upstairs all night. Um, my father finally realized the dog was out in the dog pen about 10 o'clock and went and rescued him. He was sitting on his dog house <laughs> uh, that was floating. Right. So the next morning, the Army Corps of Engineers, or the military, one of the two, sent in tanks to rescue everybody on the river. Mm -hmm. So I remember being carried out, and by then the, the water level had gone down a right. little bit. Um, was there still water in the house? Oh yeah, and mud, mud up to the walls. Um, it may not have been the next day, but I think it was. Anyway, I remember being carried out by some big burly guy and put down the big chute in a tank. And there were bunches of people in there already, and it was kind of surreal. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're a little kid, and you just kind of really don't know what's happening. So then we went to the St. George Hotel, because we had nowhere to go. And you couldn't stay there, because, you know... Everything was disrupted. No electricity, no plumbing, no nothing. Right. And I think we stayed there a week. But a lot of people relocated there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how they had people there if downtown was flooded. But maybe because they had a lot of upper levels. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure what they did for food. I know the Red Cross was involved. Salvation Army was involved. Um, but like I said, my father, his primary concern after getting the boats tied up was um, his mortuary business. He had to go down and take care of that. Where was the mortuary exactly? Right where the Planned Parenthood building is on Laurel. So Taco Bell, Saturn Cafe, his mortuary, right behind um, that liquor store. Understood. Right there. And he'd been there since 1938, so 38 to 55. He sold the business shortly after the flood. I don't remember how long. But... Um, so he was concerned about the, his business. The caskets. Yeah, I mean, he had to go <laughs> rescue everything down there. The caskets were floating, literally floating. So they have an elevator that was still working, and they took it to the upstairs apartment. Uh -huh. So that's how they, and other than that, I don't know what else happened. But, um, yeah, it was pretty bad. Hopefully there weren't any bodies. There weren't people out of the caskets right. that's all he was he came home and he said they're still contained or something like that i don't remember what he wow. said um so then so you guys were at the saint george right you were there for about a week and then they let everybody go back to the homes the water had receded and there was mud everywhere in the house outside the house um I remember one of the Salvation Army people came by, and I was outside, and um, she said to my mother, you shouldn't be letting her play out here. It's unsanitary. And my mother said, it's the same mud that's in the house. <laughs> Smart mom. Yeah. So I don't remember exactly what happened other than the next step I do remember was when they condemned all the houses on the river, um, and then auctioned them off. And fortunately, my father had a lot, one street over on Riverside Avenue, that he could move the house to. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, somebody bid against his house and jacked the price up. He had to buy his house back. They wouldn't just let him move it. It was very odd. So they didn't give him any money for the house. I don't know. I don't remember. It's too little. I understood. But um, I just remember he was so upset that he had to buy his house back, and this guy bid against him, jacked up the price. So the house 
and that's that slide. Right. Got taken off its foundation, moved through an empty lot over to 631 Riverside. It's still there. Um, we did live in the house there after it was moved. And then for a while we lived up on Broadway. But um, the house was still, it was obviously salvageable. So, but that was my dad's dream home. I mean, mm -hmm. it was amazing. He had a huge, the, the lots were large for that area. Right. So the houses had all this space that went down to the river. And like, you know, there were docks and idyllic. It was just eucalyptus trees and beautiful and ducks and salmon run. And it was, you know, I mean, to live on a river is like a big deal. Oh, and sure. to live on that river, because it was expensive. I think it cost him like $40,000 to build it then, which was expensive. Sure. And you were, you were right on the river. Yeah, it was amazing. Were you able to get the mud and silt and stuff out of the house? Were you, was, were you able to Days clean and it? days and months. My mother said for years it would come up through the linoleum. Uh-huh. Seep up. She said you just could never get rid of it. Any memories of Christmas that year? It was in the Civic Auditorium. Salvation Army held a, a Christmas party. I don't know why that wasn't flooded, but they held a Christmas party in there for the kids, uh -huh. the neighbor, all the Santa Cruz kids. Uh -huh. And I think they had a present for everybody and cookies. And so they invited all the children of Santa Cruz to go. To, I remember going to that. Understood. Understood. Well, an effort to, to make the holiday a little Something. more special, yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, how did the flood change Santa Cruz? Oh, God. Well, just looking at the levees, it's tragic. Um, we all love that river. Um, you know, I was still young, so I didn't grow up on the river, but I was there long enough and with my dad's boats and everything, it was just um, a beautiful place. You know, it was a centerpiece, went right through the, the town. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, besides just the traumatic nature of the event, um, then the Army Corps of Engineers came in and, like I said before, screwed up the salmon run because they dumped concrete at the bottom of the river. I'm not sure what their logic was on that. I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. Mm -hmm. Army Corps of Engineers have done some interesting projects, and I'm, I'm sure it's all related to money. Um, then they built that horrible levee, and I remember when I was in the eighth grade or something, um, we went on a field trip somewhere, and I asked whoever was in charge of the field trip why they never built or planted trees on the, make it more aesthetic after they right. built it. Why couldn't they have put foliage back? Right. And supposedly the answer was that it would undermine the construction of the levee, which I guess could be accurate. What is it important for people to understand about the flood? Well, it's a major event in the history of Santa Cruz, and um, you know, it's like anything. When it's major event happens, it it shapes the people that live here in different ways. So, like I said, it changed businesses, mm -hmm. changed you know, obviously memories, changed um, the river, obviously, and. Supposedly, they said it would never happen again, um, and I, I tend to think that's true because we've had two major uh, flooding mm -hmm. potential events, like 82 and another time. So mm -hmm. I think the town is safe. So whatever they set out to do with the levee has worked. This concludes part two of my presentation. Special thanks to Sharon Nystrom-Watson, Mary Pizzoni, and all my other interviewees
for sharing their memories of the flood of 55. Again, if anyone has any questions or comments about my presentation or wants to contribute to our growing archive of information about the flood, please contact me at eastsidehistory at gmail.com. Thank you very much.